When I spend my time gaming, I had zero confidence. I couldn't carry on a conversation. I couldn't look people in the eyes. I looked up some website where you can enter your Steam profile and see the total hours for all the games. At the time that I checked, it was like 8,000. So I remember sitting that day and I was just thinking like, holy crap. That was pretty much the turning point where I realized it's either gaming or trying to do other things. Sometimes you might argue the semantics of, well, I'm only playing for a couple hours a day. And what you're describing is you're only physically playing the game for a couple hours a day. You're also thinking about the game or you're even then watching content for multiple hours a day. And now all of a sudden gaming just in the amount of like play, thinking and just overall computer time, it's your entire day. But the truth is, one day you're gonna die and your days are limited. You really do want to make the most out of it. Weighing up what you're doing and seeing it play out long term can drastically change everything. Boredom ultimately is the leverage. If you allow yourself to set those quiet moments, no distractions, just with yourself, and you really ask yourself a question like, what is it that I want? It might be a quiet voice right now, but it's there. And if you're curious about it and you have the courage to start leaning into it, start taking action towards it, you can achieve it and it can bring you an immense amount of purpose in your life. Right now, if you feel like there isn't anything that you want, I would challenge you that it's time to get a bit more quiet and just be with yourself and sit there until eventually there will be something that you want and that's sometimes where the best ideas ultimately come from. Gleb, welcome to Game Quarters. I guess I don't know if I should even say welcome to Game Quarters because you're as much part of this as I am. I've been here for, I think, a year now? No, longer than that. It's at least two years. Yeah. If not, like, it might be longer than that, but, but probably at least, yeah, I guess like something probably around October, just over two years ago. Yeah, time flies. I actually didn't realize it's been that long. Yeah, it's crazy. And all right, so for people who don't know, so Gleb helps edit the videos. You guys have probably seen Gleb's been in a couple of videos, also just kind of sharing his story and stuff. And, and so today we just want to kind of go back and, and go through like what this journey has been like for you. So take us back. What's your first memory with video games? I think my first memory was actually like the first first memory was getting the like a phone for the first time. And um, I think I started playing Snake on it. Obviously, I didn't get addicted to it because there's not much to it. Yeah, it was Snake. It was fun, though. I, I think I got the high score, and after that, I just quit. Like, um, when you actually get the Snake to the full length, then you can't move anymore. I got to that point. But then, at some point, my parents got me a PSP, the PlayStation Portable, and that's when it really started. Like, I remember going through every single game, whatever the discs that I had. I think my friends also had discs at school, so we would swap discs and I would play their games as well. Then at some point my brothers got PSP, so then we would start like playing multiplayer, some of the games, like completing them over and over. And yeah, from there it's just bigger devices, so bigger games. So I got my PC when I was like 10, I think. And then I started playing like browser games, like some Lego games, and eventually like CS, uh, Gary Smod, all of those like original source games. And then eventually, obviously, my dad got a PlayStation for us. And that's where it all started as well. Trying to get all the achievements. Uh, and yeah, like really getting stuck into the multiplayer there. And what do you think like, so obviously there's different types of gamers, right? There's like the more competitive players, the achievers. There's people who like variety games. There's people who like kind of more the narratives and like the open worlds. Like how would you describe yourself as a gamer? I think I went through basically every stage because at the start I just played single player games and a lot of, I know a lot of people say that um, you can't really get addicted to those and those are okay, they're not so, not so bad. But personally, like for me, the, the story in it was crazy. You know, like how you, when you read a book, you get immersed into that world. Uh, for me, the single player games were the same. It's like you're fully immersed, you want to finish it and then you want to do it again just to like see if you can find any hidden secrets and Easter eggs. Um, but then eventually I think the, when it got the worst was definitely multiplayer. Um, I'm a very competitive person. So there it was like, I want to be the best every match. I want to get better. Like when I was playing CSGO, I would actually train my aim as well. Like I, I remember installing some game where you can train your aim. Like it shows you all these dots and then you're literally training just to be better in the game. Yeah. I think that was multiplayer was definitely the lowest point. And what do you think it was that was like, that kept you playing so much? Was it just trying to pursue that sense of mastery? Was it the competition? Like, what was it that kind of kept you playing? I think it was a mixture of escapism and 
accomplishment because the the most highlight like in life you remember the things that are like the most important to you and the memories that i remember the most from gaming were definitely like accomplishing something so it's like oh i got this like really rare item or i achieved this rank in csgo or i built this thing in minecraft so it was definitely accomplishment was definitely a big part of it um and then the other part was escapism it's like whatever problems i had um i would just get into games and then you forget about it you don't have to think about it it's you're completely removed from the real world and you're in this better universe where everything is perfect everything is shiny everything is exciting and so what was life like growing up because you're from russia but i know you've lived in thailand for a long time so what was life like for you growing up and like where did gaming kind of fit into that i've actually had a pretty good childhood i would say um, I'd never had any problems. I never like run into bullying. Um, it was mostly just detaching myself from games. And I think my parents gave me like a lot of freedom to do whatever I wanted. And my mom was afraid to ever like ban us from anything. She didn't want to like drive us away from loving her. So I feel like she just let us do whatever we want. And that's where gaming fit in. It was like, I just started doing it. It was more fun than anything else. Why do anything else? And in Russia, it's like really cold. The district that we lived in, it's, um, it's a little bit scary. Like there is some crime going on. Like we were in the nice section, but if you actually leave that area, it can be quite intimidating for a kid to just spend time there by themselves. So I think gaming fit into there as well. I didn't have to get into that kind of environment i could just stay in my safe environment i didn't have to expose myself and in thailand i'm not sure what happened because everything when we moved here everything is perfect you got the beach you got a, a really nice environment to spend your time in but gaming still still got me i didn't want to go outside whenever my parents would try to get me and my brothers out to like go to the beach if you just get grumpy like no and then try to fight our parents like get into fights as well i remember a lot of shouting and um, yeah we just stay home and play or even if we do go out we do go to the beach my parents try their best to like spend out the, their time with us um we would just not be present we'd just be sitting on like sitting there like oh when are we gonna go home i want to get back to the computer i want to get back on the game it's like my friends are waiting for me and I, I think that's that last point is actually a really key one because when we're you know more or less in in an addiction or when something's a bit of a problem part of the behavior that we end up having is we are always in a rush to finish everything so we can get back because the goal is to maximize how much time we can play. And so we end up removing a lot of things that might get in the way of that. Like for me, it was school. I dropped classes. I wanted to play CS so I could play CS all day. I didn't have school. Then I could just play. So you remove obstacles that, that get in the way. That can be relationships. That can be work or responsibilities. But then when we do have some things we need to do, we're always in a rush to kind of get it done as quick as we can so we can get back and get a little bit more time to play. And I've definitely noticed that going to the grocery store, being irritable with my family, just trying to like make things a little bit uncomfortable so I can get back and just keep playing. And that's definitely, I think, a sign that like for anybody watching, you know, you might find yourself right now in, in a bit of that position of always trying to, to find a little bit of extra time to play. Yeah, and I think it's, it removes you from being present you can just sit there and enjoy the moment and enjoy the presence of your family, your friends. You're just waiting for the next two hours when you can just go back and get into this other world. And so it's hard to actually connect with people around you. So it just makes it even worse. You're like, oh, I'm just going to go out with my family again. It's going to be boring. We're going to have nothing to talk about. We're going to get into a fight. But why did those fights and this uncomfortable things start in the first place? It is the games. And in addiction criteria, one of the criteria would be something called preoccupation. So preoccupation is about kind of like constantly thinking about the thing, like in this context, gaming. So constantly thinking about gaming, thinking about gaming as like the source of your thoughts around self-esteem and just being kind of overall consumed mentally by the activity. And this is also something people can watch out for because sometimes you might argue the semantics of, well, I'm only playing for a couple hours a day. And what you're describing is you're only physically playing the game for a couple hours a day, but 
you're also thinking about the game for many, many hours a day, or you're even then watching content for multiple hours a day. And now all of a sudden gaming, just in the amount of like play thinking and just overall computer time, it's your entire day. And so it's not just how much are you actually playing that game of Valorant? It's how much are you thinking about it? How much is it occupying your thoughts and, and just the attention that you have and, and your ability to be present with other people? Yeah, I never thought of it this way, but it actually makes a lot of sense because uh, our brain is limited in what we can think about. So if you just preoccupy your brain with just that thing, yeah, the, the, the time you spend on it is definitely more than just gaming. And did you have other hobbies that you enjoyed growing up or it was really just, you know, gaming was kind of always there? Um, I had a lot of friends because I was smart at school. So sometimes I would go out and we'd spend time together. Uh, but I think once I moved to Thailand, uh, you go more into gaming because when I came here, I had very bad English. And most of the people that I connected with was actually from Minecraft. Um, I remember I took this like English course and then I was like so excited. I was like, oh, I'm going to get on the game and I can sp actually speak to my friends, not just point or whatever, send the signals or how else we communicated. So I give actually games like props to that. It helped me develop English and socialize with my friends. But um, from there on, yeah, I didn't, we didn't get into much hobbies. And actually, I would go to my friend's houses sometimes to sleep over. But all we would do there is also just game. We would just stay until like three or four in the morning playing that uh, online M MMORPG game. Literally just all night just playing. So I would go to his house, we sit at his computer and we just take turns. <laughs> like it, was, it was pretty funny. But uh, I only developed like proper hobbies when I was like 17 or 18. That's when it actually took off. Not, not to kind of spoil things, but you know, I know you pretty well. And nowadays... You know, you like the motorcycle, you do Muay Thai, obviously video editing is your career. You have many other things that you do. And so what did that transition look like from being that kind of like, you know, at the time you were 16, 17 years old until now, where at the time you were just kind of gaming, gaming was kind of all you were thinking about, all you were doing, all you were doing with your friends to now where you have a very balanced life. You're very intentional in what you eat you have a relationship, you know, you have other hobbies and interests that you really like. So what did that transition look like from being at that point where gaming was like really all you had to now? Yeah, it all started off with just trying Muay Thai because um, one day my parents just told me that I need to make money and if I want to stay in Thailand. So uh, I figured my way out and I ended up getting a job, which is a long story. But, um, and there eventually... I I'd ended up trying what, Muay Thai because we had classes for that. And my first initial reaction was like, this stuff is crazy. This is just for like violent people who have problems. Like we live in this like civilized society. Why does anybody want to fight? Uh, but I just decided to give it a go because why not? I'm like training, uh, sorry, I'm working there. So I might as well give it a go. And uh, yeah, I trained for a bit. I liked it, but I, at the time I was still gaming. So it was hard to balance it. Like. If you're training Muay Thai, you, you're not going to get good by just going there for a few sessions. If you want to get really good, you got to train like the Thais. you got to train two times a day, do the runs, do the clinch work, everything. And I could only train like once a day. And uh, I said it as a joke to one of my trainers. I was like, I want to fight. It was literally just a joke. I was like, oh, maybe I should fight. The next day he comes up to me, Gleb, 30 days, Chiang Stadium, fight. Da -da -da. And... Uh, I'm so glad at that point because I was really scared. I was like, this is something that I've never done before. I'm just, I was literally just joking about this. Um, but now I'm presented with this option that I should fight. And uh, I think honestly, on, honestly speaking, I wasn't being brave. I wasn't being overconfident that I could do this. To me, it was literally just out of fear. I didn't want to disappoint my trainers and I didn't want to look like a loser. So I was like, okay, I'll do it. Just to like, not to, not, just to feed my ego basically. And um, yeah, from there, I had no choice but to actually quit gaming and actually like fully commit myself to training because like when you're training for Muay Thai fight, the regimen is like you wake up like six in the morning, you go for like a 5k run. And uh, after that, you do like a morning session, you rest in the evening, you do another session. And then after that, you do even like strength training. So it was like four or five hours of training per day. And you cannot do that while you're also working and trying to game. It's just impossible. So I had to cut it off. 
that was pretty much the turning point where I realized like it's either gaming or trying to do other things. And yeah, that worked out well. Like I, I won my fight and from there on, I just pretty much stuck to my tie as a hobby. I don't do it so much anymore, but I've replaced it with other hobbies. And as the time went on, I started introducing other hobbies and basically just doing things that I dreamed of doing as a kid or I had this like little seeds planted in my mind that I wanted to do and I ended up doing them. Like uh, as a kid, I always found motorbikes really cool and I always thought it, was like, it would be cool to have one. Like all my friends had one. But once I started making money, I could actually make those things come true. I got the motorbike. When we lived in Chiang Mai, the roads there were amazing. So it was perfect opportunity for that. And just introducing other hobbies, like for friends, like CrossFit. Like uh, when I was in Bangkok, I started doing a bit of boxing rather than Muay Thai. It's, uh, yeah, just basically doing the things that I find cool. What's, what's interesting about the, so what's interesting about the trainer committing you to a fight? is then you have accountability. It reminds me of when I committed to doing the TED Talk. So, you know, I applied for it. Somehow they accepted me. And all of a sudden, it was like, in five weeks, I'm going to be standing on stage speaking in front of 2,000 people. And I need to make sure that I don't embarrass myself, right? So for you training for the fight, it's like, you don't want to lose. You don't want to get beat up. You don't want to be embarrassed. And so now you have a choice of like, either I go all in and make sure that like this turns out to be good or this is going to turn out really, really bad. Yeah, there's no going back. <laughs> right. And so you're all in, right? For me with the TED Talk, the first one, it's all I did for five weeks. I woke up every day, visualized it. I had a whole routine around it. I read every book I could on like how to do a good one. You know, I just like, it was my only focus for five weeks because I really wanted to do a really good job. And I had skin in the game, right? I had that accountability. But it started before that by being curious, being a bit curious, like I'm working in the gym, they do Muay Thai, Muay Thai here in Thailand, like it's everywhere. So you were curious enough and then you had the courage to actually go and like try it one time. And I, I share it this way because I know for you guys watching this, like there are so many guys, it's gaming is the only hobby you have. And you might have a bit of a feeling of, oh, I, it'd be really cool to try this or try that. Being curious about it's the start and then having the courage to just try it once. Because once you try it once, maybe you like it. Maybe you don't like it. And that can be valuable too. But having the courage to go and try it and then have the courage to keep going and not just doing it one time, but like seeing what you did enjoy about it. And then you can kind of keep progressing it from there. Now, another key idea I think that, that comes from you is there were benefits that you had from gaming, right? You enjoyed gaming, like the, the achievement, the mastery, the competition, playing with your friends. But there were also benefits for you of doing Muay Thai. So what were some of those benefits? Yeah, I want to expand a little bit on the thing that you mentioned before about uh, being brave enough to start something for the first time. So I think it's a good point. Most people think that um, all the successful people and powerful people they don't have any fears. They think that they just wake up and they're like, they have no fear to start this new business. For them, it's like a normal day. But in reality, everybody has fears. And without facing them, you're never going to build up the courage to do anything. And it is scary for everyone to do anything for the first time. So... If you want to do something and you even have this tiny seed of wanting to try something, you should just act on it. Commit yourself. Try it one time. And before that, you can really think, like, what's the worst thing that can happen? I want to try a kickboxing class. You're scared of it. But what is the worst thing that can happen? Like, you show up to the class and you don't like it. You never go there again. You're never going to see those people again. You just have to give it a go. With your TED Talk, obviously, the stakes are a lot bigger. You can embarrass yourself in front of thousands of people. But at the end of the day, are you going to see any of those people ever again? Chances are probably not. So sometimes you just have to pull the lever and take the action. And something I just want to mention quick is like, I find, so when I work with clients, they're trying new activities or trying new hobbies. And one mindset that definitely holds them back is only focusing on the things they didn't like about the activity rather than trying to find the things that they did like about it. So for me, like I used to go to a hip hop dance class every Monday night. I needed something to do, something to fill my time. 
So I used to go to this hip hop dance class. Now for me, it wasn't like I was going to become like a great dancer. It wasn't like I was, I was going to, uh, to be performing or anything like that. For me, it was just like, I was able to meet some people. I had like something on my schedule on Monday night. So I wasn't just kind of bored at home. And I went with my buddies. So we got to like spend some time together and usually we'd have dinner after or something like that. That was the benefit. It wasn't like even about the activity itself. It was just about kind of how it helped me in my life. And at that time, having activities every single night really helped me be out of the house. And so you want to just like, you might not necessarily find your new passion right away. And you have to be a bit patient with that. But when you do an activity, if you have the courage to try it, try to also just be mindful of like, what, what was nice about this activity. Maybe it was just getting out of the house. But there are a lot of benefits to it. And, and if you pay a bit more attention to the positives that, that are there, it actually does encourage you to try it again or, or to keep trying other things rather than only focusing on, well, compared to gaming, hip hop was like crap. Right. But that's not the point. Like the point is if you compare that to gaming, nothing's ever going to compete with gaming for a number of reasons I could go into. But if you get out of gaming, all of a sudden you find like all these other things are amazing. Right. So you just have to kind of break out of that cycle first. Yeah. It's like, um, there's no mistakes, only lessons. Even if you do something that has a thousand negatives, there's still positives they can find in it. And, uh, yeah, when you, spend your entire life doing this one thing every little extra action can actually change your life like completely i would have never known that muay thai will change me and change the, tra the trajectory of my life and uh, just taking that step and taking the risk and it's absolutely worth it for most things just to experience something new yeah uh, but going back to your benefit benefits thing The benefits are definitely different. The The benefits of gaming was just just twofold. Like one of them was that I learned how to initially socialize. And the second one was that I learned how to use computers really well. And some people might hear that and they use that as a cope. They're like, oh, uh, gaming is going to make me like really smart on my computer or it's going to improve my reaction time. Um, I don't think you should look at it that way. It's more like you have done this hobby already and you've done this thing like you've done this thing for such a long time what can you take out from it not rationalizing is oh i'm doing this just because of this i don't think you should do it that way but the benefits of doing things in real life are literally infinite because like the muay thai uh, the biggest benefit was the confidence because when i spend my time gaming i had zero confidence i couldn't talk to anybody like i couldn't carry on a conversation i couldn't look people in the eyes And what it gave me was that initial boost to being confident in myself and knowing that I can execute on things in real life rather than just sitting there and thinking about it. I know that I can go out and really get what I want. And then from there, it, like, it literally grew everything because from there I was confident enough to eventually quit that job and like move to another city by myself and like do like outreach, like messaging people to do work for them. And things of that nature, I would have never been able to do if I didn't take that initial step of just trying Muay Thai. Um, so that was definitely a big thing. And I, I think that point that you made is actually so crucial, which is, yes, gaming can help your reaction time. But how are you ultimately taking that out of gaming and applying it in your life? Or gaming can help you have a social community, so maybe you don't feel so lonely. But again, how are you taking that and applying it in other areas of your life? Gaming can teach you how to use a computer. But if you don't take that and apply it, you know, I, I know for you it was video editing. If you don't apply it in that way, you're not really going to get any of those benefits. And so it's ultimately like, yes, it can teach you a lot. But ultimately, how are you going to use it so you can move forward in your life? One way people can think about this is ultimately about the ROI of your time. Where are you spending your time? And ultimately, what are you getting out of it? It's not just like, what are you learning? But what are you applying? For instance, right now, you might be gaming a lot. You might be someone watching this channel saying like, I'm, I play a lot of games. My life isn't going so well. I'm not really working, making money. I don't feel very confident. I feel quite lonely in my life. And that's the stage that you're at. 
Now I understand this stage. That's where I started to, that's certainly where you started as well. That's where everybody starts. But look at the outcome that you've achieved in your life based on ultimately how you've been spending your time. Because that's ultimately the ROI that you're getting. So by playing video games, eight, nine, 10 hours a day, six hours a day, however many hours a day, the outcome that you're ultimately receiving is you're not feeling confident. You feel lonely outside the, outside the gaming world. You're not really making any money, conflict with friends and family. If you spend your time differently, you might have a totally different outcome. Maybe you're working, maybe you're making some money. Maybe you're out there like working at a restaurant so you're, you have an opportunity to kind of improve your social skills. Maybe you start Muay Thai and that teaches you confidence. How you spend your time ultimately has an ROI. And if the outcome you have right now in your life is not what you want, just simply try with curiosity and courage different ways to spend your time. And you might get a totally different outcome. Maybe you don't, but certainly the outcome that you have right now is tied to how you're spending your time. So if you try something different, maybe you have a chance to just have a different outcome. Yeah, I, f I feel like some people would look at this and they would think of it as, oh, it's such an analytical approach to life, R ROI, like return of investment on my life. But the truth is, one day you're going to die and uh, your days are limited. So you really do want to make the most out of it and weighing up what you're doing and seeing it play out long term can drastically change everything. Like I mentioned, I like gaming helped me like get really, really good at computers. But what if I took that 20,000 hours or 30,000 hours, whatever I spent on gaming, and I actually put that into learning how to use the computers, I would be a god at it now. I would easily be like a complete master. And that was actually one of the things that also helped me realize that I had some kind of gaming problem was that I, I watched a thing at TED Talk and somebody mentioned how it takes like 10,000 hours to master something. I don't remember if it was master or become like proficient enough to know your own mistakes. Not sure. But then I looked at my, I looked up on the webs, like some website where you can enter your Steam profile and see the total hours for all the games. And at the time that I checked, it was like 18 or 20,000. And that's just including Steam games. That's not including Minecraft. That's not including Starcraft that are like on a completely different launchers. So I remember sitting that day and I was just thinking like, holy crap, like all of these hours, like I could have been like really good at all these other things. Like one of my other friends was playing guitar. He was spending a lot of his free time playing guitar. I was like, and I always was jealous. I was like, I can never do this. But then I thought I was like, what if I took this 18,000 hours and I put them at the guitar? I'd be a, a guitar hero. Um, so f for me, that was a big mindset shift. It's like seeing these hours is um and just seeing how it could have played out differently like changed a lot for me i think it's a huge point like that's ultimately the results you have in your life come down to how you spend your time i was speaking with a gamer the other day and this gamer is a bit unique in the sense that he's actually made money playing games now people listening to this are like this is the dream like this guy made money playing video games it's amazing he made ten thousand dollars okay now if you're watching this right now like i have an offer to make I will give you $10,000. Now, some of you are like, you know, <laughs> like, where do I send my bank account? Like send, send the bank details, like cash app, like send, send the cash. Some of you watching are maybe a little bit skeptical. You're like, what's, what's the, like, what's the deal? What's the twist? Like, like ultimately what, what's the trade? And so I'll give you $10,000, but in exchange, I want 15,000 hours of your time. Now, some of you are still like, yo, what's, here are my bank details. I'll take the, I'll take the cash. And some of you are, are calling the cops for child labor, right? So ultimately, the trade is you got to weigh it up. So the, this gamer I was speaking to, he made $10,000 playing Valorant and Rainbow Six Siege. And when we totaled up the number of hours that he spent playing these games, it's 15,000 hours, which means that he's made 60 cents an hour playing these games. Now, if he works just a normal, regular nine to five entry level job, minimum wage, that would be the equivalent of like, I think around like $70,000. Totally different ROI for the time. And who wouldn't want an extra like 70, 80 grand in your bank account right now? So how you spend your time matters, not just financially, 
but ultimately in the skills that it's developing and where it's moving you in your life. And I think the reality when it comes to gaming for most people, especially if you're playing more than like a couple hours a day, it's occupying and consuming so much of your time and attention that it's taking away from you being able to ultimately focus that on time that you could get a much better ROI. Yeah, definitely. The the money thing definitely puts it into perspective. And uh, one thing you could think there also is like, what could you do with that money? It's like, imagine all these things. For sure, you have some thoughts of, I wanted to like go to Japan. I want to visit Tokyo or I want to at least like go to a different state and if you live in the US. Like that money could make you make it available for you to do whatever you want. Maybe you want to get into skiing. You, you can afford to do that or you can buy yourself a snowmobile, whatever it is. So limiting yourself to just gaming. Like people think that oh, I can just play all these different games and have all these different experiences. I can exper- no, I can like become a a cowboy or a, I can become a miner, whatever. Um but all these experiences are limiting you from the experiences that you could be having in real life. The, though in real life you do have to work and you have to earn money to do those things. But ultimately, those are the memories that you're going to remember. Like if you put yourself, if you take two situations, one where you were a cowboy in a game, like you're playing Red Dead, Red Dead Redemption, riding on a horse, shooting, whatever, and then you did that in real life. You put yourself on a horse in real life. Like, I don't know, going to like a, in a field and then shooting some targets you're going to remember the thing you did in real life. You're going to completely forget that Red Redemption thing, for sure. So it's just realizing that real life experiences hold much higher value. And it's actually the reason why you play games in the first place is that it replicates the best things of life, but it only replicates it to like a tiny little fraction. So if you want to live the most out of your life and actually like even if you're like living your life to maximize dopamine like you just want to feel amazing all the time you want to live the real life not the video game life and the sense of purpose is very different as well and so what's that journey been like for you of of kind of finding a greater sense of purpose in your life because gaming when you're gaming it's like well i gotta wake up i gotta do this mission i gotta complete these bosses and and level up and it gives you a sense of purpose in that way but then moving on from games can feel challenging if you don't have a different sense of purpose so what what sense of purpose in real life looked like for you yeah i think logging in every day and doing those things was more of a chore <laughs> it's like you feel like you have to do it uh that's actually like a f- now really funny looking back at it that i would have to literally just log in to collect this daily rewards to make sure i could hit my 30 days streak and then the 30 days i get the maximum reward but it made sense why i did it um but real life purpose um it's a little bit of a hard question still because for me, I'm still trying to figure it out. There's like, it's always a moving target. Uh, but now the main thing I'm trying to focus on is just being present every single day and whatever actions I'm taking, like being fully present, experiencing it, not just thinking about the next thing. And um, seeing life beyond just work. Like it's easy to also get caught up in it and just focusing on the money and trying to like build a much bigger picture like i know i'm young i'm only 23 but it's already like trying to plan ahead of what kind of family life i want to have where do i want to settle um because planning those things ahead is going to make a big difference like i can think of it later on when i'm like 30 but why if i can already start planning ahead and i think a lot of it evolved also like diving it like really deep and understanding what really matters to me and for me it was family like um i know my brothers are struggling with a similar thing they're like going into gaming very very deep so for me it's also being able to be the best version of myself and um try to be uh, like a role model because i wish that i had that as a when i was young i wish i had like a older brother who was there and i could literally just look up to and copy what they do and i'll be fine in life so i'm trying to do a bit of that too and uh, yeah, just making sure that I can retire my parents and build a nice family. <laughs> and you've mentioned a few times, like being able to go deep, being able to be present, being able to kind of actually like sit with yourself and reflect on what is important to you, what your values are, ultimately what you want in life. And so like, do you have tools that you use to do that? Or like, what's your process? Like if someone's watching this and they're like, 
that that sounds kind of interesting. I I want to do that. How do I do it? How do you do it? Um, the tool number one is just getting off your phone, <laughs> like as simple as it sounds. But removing your phone and just limiting your screen time makes a massive difference. Like I've turned off my notifications on my phone for a long time now. Like the only notifications I have is like uh, for like one of the work messengers that I use and that's it. And even that sometimes I turn off so I don't get any notifications. I don't have a reason to pick up the phone. Like when I pick it up, there is maybe one or two notifications that I have to see. And it's usually because I forgot to turn off notifications there. So removing my phone is definitely one of the biggest things because then when I go somewhere, I don't have to go on it. Um, I can just sit and think and like let the boredom kick in. That's one thing as well. Um, Because when the boredom kicks in, you always have this like new thoughts and new ideas that you wouldn't get if you're always constantly stimulating yourself. And yeah, just honestly for me, it was just trying to remove technology as much as possible because you spent all day already like working. I already spent all day working on the computer. So I think you've got to give yourself a little bit of time to get away from that. No content consumed. No notifications to catch up to. Just you, yourself, or other people socializing or spending time in nature. You said something that a lot of people, I think, will think is crazy. Well, maybe two two things are kind of connected. The first is just you and yourself. Being just with you and yourself. For a lot of people they're currently living completely opposite. It's constant distraction, constant entertainment, engagement. It's the opposite of wanting to just sit there and be with yourself. And so how have you managed to make that transition? Yeah, it's definitely not easy because when you start doing it for the first times, it's um, you get really bored. That's one thing. And you're like already preconditioned to stimulate your brain. Or you start getting thoughts that... Are not very comfortable you start thinking about the times you messed up somewhere or how maybe you're not living up to your full potential or this thing and that thing um but one thing there i find really useful is just observing your thoughts and not really judging them like a lot of the times you have your thoughts people would go into it and they would try to overthink oh sorry they will overthink it or they would try to judge their thoughts like why am i having this thought it's like i don't want to think about this but for me, it's just sitting there observing it. It's like, oh, I thought of this. Why did that come up? And just trying to dig a little bit deeper. And um, you asked me about, what was it, transitioning into it? Or? Yeah, how, how have you managed to be comfortable with that? Just time. Um, like everything good in life, it takes time. So it's like the longer you practice it, the the more comfortable it gets. And... Yeah, just being okay with not being okay sometimes. Like um, a lot of people are trying to always feel good 24-7, always happy, always entertained, always joyful. But life is a little bit beyond that. And you actually, you cannot feel full joy and full happiness without being able to also feel like the sad feelings and be able to sit through it and accept it rather than just trying to get rid of it. It's like, it's okay to sometimes be sad and feel bored and feel alone as long as you can know how to deal with those emotions, which takes time. Because if you know how to deal with those emotions and sit through them and actually experience them, not judge them, just observe them, when you do have good emotions like joy and happiness, it's a whole different level because you're able to balance these two different emotions against each other, like have a contrast. But if you're always feeling happy, you're always stimulated, like you're always like not even happy, but yeah, like always stimulated. You're just always watching this exciting series or you're always like playing this certain game that just gets you like super amped up. You're always like like this. It, you just reach that baseline where nothing really excites you anymore. You are just, that's literally just where you sit at. There's another crazy thing that you said for a lot of people watching, which is to invite the boredom. So much of our lives right now, we are trying to do anything but experience boredom. Now, when you're talking about dopamine baselines, we have videos on this. You know, I'll link them in the description. But one of the key ideas is that the more you're used to a high level of stimulation, a high level of dopamine, the lower your overall baseline ends up being. And one way you can think about this is currently experiencing boredom might actually feel like pain 
it might literally feel painful. You might not consciously recognize that. It might be more of a subconscious experience, but boredom feels painful. Boredom ultimately is the leverage where if you use boredom, all of a sudden other things start to be really interesting. Like work compared to staring at the ceiling, work seems amazing. Work compared to playing video games all day, work seems like ter a terrible trade. So boredom ultimately is actually a tool. And if you use boredom, you can start to find a lot of creativity, a lot of motivation, a lot of inspiration, a lot of new ideas. But if boredom currently feels painful, then you'll always be trying to escape from it or always trying to stimulate yourself so you never have to feel it. How are you able to invite boredom in your life? One thing was definitely noticing that the best insights and the best thoughts uh, that I've ever had was when I was like really bored. I was not reading. I was not on my phone. I was not doing anything. I was just there by myself. So I think from, from that point on, it was just, it's quite easy. I, I just realized like whenever I'm bored, I have no stimulation, uh, n no like external things, then um, insights will come. So it became actually quite fun inviting into the, my life. But before that, it was just trying it out, like bit by bit. Um, one big thing was like tr trying to do meditation. Um, and a lot of people would do it like using some kind of apps and um, some kind of like YouTube videos, like guided meditation, which is okay. I think it's a really good starting point. Um, so if anybody wants to get into that, I would recommend maybe watching like one or two guided meditations and then just trying to do it by yourself and not forcing yourself to like, like my girlfriend, she meditates for like an hour every day sometimes. A freaking hour every day of her life, for like seven hours a week. To me, that's crazy. Like I could not do that long. But, and you know, she didn't get there from just overnight. It took her like many days to get to that point, many months. Um, so if you want to like do that, obviously you do it by baby steps. You could just do five minutes. Next day, you could do 10 minutes. And then next week, you could try 15 minutes. But it's just being consistent and actually committing to it rather than just being like, oh, tomorrow I might do it, I might not. Even myself, I've done it quite a lot of times now and I've had months and weeks when I've done this consistently. Um, but I would still write it in my calendar. Like if I, wanna, if I wanna make sure something is done, I just make sure that I sit down the day before and I write it down on like Google Calendar or even on a notepad, whatever. Because the next day you don't have to make that decision you've already made that decision the day before because you don't know how you're going to feel the next day you don't know if you're going to be super tired you're going to have a migraine you're going to have a headache you don't know what's going to happen but when you make the decision the day before on a clear mind it's much easier to stick to it because you're like oh okay i've already decided i'm going to do it i'm just going to commit to it so that's definitely like a little hack as well yeah i think avoiding making decisions based on your mood is really crucial because your mood fluctuates it can be based off what you eat based off how you slept, based on like what's going on in your life. And so your mood changes. But in those moments when you have clarity, you make certain decisions. Being able to follow through with those decisions when you're no longer so clear, that's actually a huge part of what you need to navigate. And so being able to make those decisions earlier and set them in your calendar, then it's something you're going to follow through with because you have already committed to it rather than, well, I'll see how I'll feel in that moment. And probably in that moment, you'll feel like doing anything but that thing that you had hoped or wanted to do before, even if it's, I'm just going to sit on the couch and stare at my phone, or you don't know what you're going to do in that moment. So then you end up being like, oh, well, I guess I have nothing to do. So I guess I'll pull up my phone and just look at Twitter and <laughs> whatever else is going on in the world compared to being intentional about how you're spending your time. Yeah. And it's like mini commitment pretty much like even let's say this podcast as an example like we've already decided like i think a day or uh, a day before that that we're going to do this on this day at this time but if i woke up this morning and then you message me hey you want to do a podcast in 30 minutes i probably would have come here this is same <laughs> there's no chance if we didn't decide to do this like yesterday or the day before or whatever hey at like 10 we're gonna meet and do this there's no way it happened there's no way because I would have even just like the amount of setup, like what's my mood? Oh, I guess I'm not going to the gym at 10 like I normally do. I'm kind of tired. Like, oh, I didn't sleep very good last night. Like I got a lot of other things I got to do today. 
there's no way I would have done it. But because we had said it, and I knew you were coming at 10, it gets done, right? And, and, and I'm glad that it's done. And it's kind of similar to like, you don't always want to go to the gym, but you're always glad you went to the gym. Like I never regret going to the gym. And you always feel better and being able to sit down and have this conversation. It's been on the list for us for quite some time. feels good to, to be able to have that. And now we can get out there into the world. And, and hopefully anybody listening or watching this, they're able to take something away that ultimately can help improve their lives in, in some way or another. So I guess that what would like a key message be for you of, of something like if you could share kind of one idea for anyone listening to this, what would that idea be? I think it would be not to be afraid of the unknown and being okay with not being okay 24 seven. Like if you fear, if you never do the things that you've never done before and you always just stick to the one thing that makes you comfortable, then that's it. You're going to be trapped in it forever. It's like, and it's, we're not even talking about like major decisions, even like little micro decisions, something that you're a little bit hesitant of, like you're a little bit afraid to do, like you're afraid to message somebody, you're afraid to do outreach when you start working or you're afraid of, I don't know, like even like stepping out, getting out of the house or like getting out of the house when it's really cold, like anything like this, like not try not to be afraid of it and just experience as much new things as you can. Like, I think for me personally, a lot of the most beneficial things in life is just trying something new, even if it's just something very noble. It doesn't have to be like, I don't know, very small. It doesn't have to be something big. Like it's just trying new things because you never know when you're going to do something else or something new and then something amazing is going to happen or you find a new hobby or you meet a new person or you get a new insight. You never know. It's like not getting stuck in this habit loop of just doing the same thing over and over. Don't be afraid to like get out and yeah, break up the pattern. And it's never too late to change. I think that's a key idea is like no matter who, what age you are, no matter what your situation is right now, it's never too late if you start to take action now. If you're going to think that it's too late, I cannot be fixed. I'm, I'm always going to be like this. It is going to be like this. Everything is about your mindset. It's anybody. Like if you go on YouTube and you search for stories of different people, people have come out of like their deepest pits. There have been people who have like gone through absolute hell, like through war, like trauma, like everything. And they have come out on the top. So if they have done it, you can do it as well. And as cheesy as it sounds, it's honestly true. Anybody can change. If, and like whatever you want, there's ways to accomplish it. And I think deep down, if you allow yourself to set those quiet moments, no distractions, just with yourself, and you really ask yourself a question like, what is it that I want? It might be a quiet voice right now, but it's there. And if you're curious about it, and you have the courage to start leaning into it, start taking action towards it, you can achieve it and it can bring you an immense amount of purpose in your life. Right now, if you feel like there isn't anything that you want, I would challenge you that it's time to get a bit more quiet and just be with yourself and sit there until eventually there will be something that you want. And that's sometimes where the best ideas ultimately come from. Gleb, thanks so much for being here. Thanks for sharing your story. Where can people connect with you? You can connect with me on Instagram, which will live in the description down below, or my YouTube channel, where I share uh, things about no-code, which could be interesting to some gamers because you can carry over your computer skills into actually building things. And uh, it was a pleasure being on here as well and sharing my thoughts and insights. And just, you know, for me, on behalf of myself, of course, but also for everybody, like, thanks so much for all the work that you've done for us. You know, I wouldn't be here certainly without you and like having you by my side is, is a huge asset for me and, and something that like really makes a big difference. So, you know, for not just this year, but last year for everything you've done. Thank you, man. And like, it's just the beginning. It's uh, it's my pleasure as well. It's honestly awesome on working on things that actually help people, not just working on things that are just for the money's sake. All right. If you guys aren't subscribed, subscribe to Game Quiz. Leave a comment below. What was like your biggest takeaway from this? And we'll talk to you guys soon.